Hello and welcome. My name is John Moberger. I am the Chief Digital Officer here at IdeaGen, and today I am honored to introduce a power chat between Atul Tandon, the CEO of Opportunity International, and Renee McAlpin, the Manager of EDU Quality Program at Opportunity EDU Finance. Renee and Atul, welcome to IdeaGen. Thank you. Glad to be here. Thanks, John. Thank, Thank you. you. So, uh, John, thanks again so much. And uh, I have to thank Adia Jen as well as uh, George and, and the whole team for this opportunity. And uh, welcome, Renee, uh, to, to uh, this conversation. Uh, so excited to have you with us. And we want to talk today about what, what to us, uh, and I know for millions of uh, school going children across the developing world, has probably been uh, a, a, one of the most uh, 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 remarkable innovations in the last decade, which is uh, bringing quality, affordable education right at their doorstep, right? And uh, uh, I'm reminded, uh, Renee, even today, after all these efforts, uh, about 263 million children who should be in school uh, across the world, mm -hmm. principally in the developing world, are not in school. Uh, and uh, I would say the number climbs to half a billion when you think about the quality of education. Mm -hmm. So, and, and we being a, a financial services nonprofit, our focus has been on livelihoods. You know, kind of stumbled into this because our our, our clients were starting businesses, starting to earn uh, uh, good earnings, uh, improve their livelihoods. They wanted good education for their children, and there wasn't that available. So, opportunity stepped into that, and now I think you know, ten years later, Renee, it's, it's really been remarkable. Twenty three countries, six and a half million children. Uh, who, who uh, have uh, been benefited by these programs, right? Close to half a million loans, almost 15,400 schools being funded. It, it's really been you know, a, a, a problem of the most untold stories uh, of uh, uh, development aid to, to the most needy and uh, the, the ones who have the, the most future ahead of them, right? So the question that I have first for you, why should people care that children get educated, especially mm -hmm. poor children get educated. You know, what difference does it make? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely, um, great question. Uh, we know education is the backbone to a lot of lifelong success. Um, we know that a, a mother who knows how to read, um, her children are less likely to have better opportunities, lifelong opportunities. We know that human capital um, and education is the backbone to developing a society um, and economic opportunity for everyone. Um, education cuts across all sectors mm -hmm. and creates as an equalizer and creates opportunity for for everyone. Um, and so it's massively important um, in crises as well as, as what we're seeing and facing now, um, ever so more important. Mm -hmm. Th thanks, Renee. Thanks so much. Now, uh, I, I, I am going to digress a bit right mm -hmm. from, from, from uh, uh, the questions because I want the audience to get to know you first. Uh, before they hear you, because I met you first in in uh, uh, in, in Kampala, right? We were visiting uh, our school programs there, and 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 you were in Kampala leading your team, providing. And we'll talk more about it, uh, a, a, a improving education quality mm -hmm. uh, in schools and slums in Kampala. Well, how did you get there? What so, led you to, to to this life? First of all, tell us about Renee. I mean, it, it was so. I, I still am so excited, and I know you are you are. Uh, uh, stranded like the rest of us uh, in, in, in the U.S. right now. But how did you get to Kampala and, and what gets, got you excited about this work? Yeah, no, great question. Um, yeah, I mean, education has always been something that I cared very much about. It's something that's given me opportunities that are far beyond anything I thought I would be doing um, when I was a kid. Um, you know, being being able to see the world um, and using that as a foundation to catalyze, you know, my dreams. And it, you know, seeing that um, was something that I wanted to invest in for others. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't feel good about taking advantage of these opportunities unless I, I saw that same thing for everyone else. And, um, you know, I, I started, you know, I've always been service oriented and I ended up actually falling into an opportunity with the United States Peace Corps. I, I joined the United States Peace Corps because I wanted to serve um, and I was assigned an education role. And that's when I directed my, you know, efforts to education after um, really, really diving in and seeing what the need was and seeing that I, you know, 
had the ability to have an impact in that space. So ever since then, kind of, you know, taking that same trajectory um, through the global education sector to find where I had the greatest value add um, based on my skills um, and, uh, you know, what I was able to do. So I've worked a bit, you know, as a, as a teacher, um, mm. I was, you know, working with, you know, large scale programs, um, you know, working on strategy for implementation, you know, how to reach, you know, the bottom of the pyramid, worked at the policy level, so a bit more macro. You know, how can we have an impact on policy to ensure quality education um, is delivered to everyone? And now finding myself here, mixing a little bit of everything that I've done um, to really find a way to to really develop a program with the greatest amount of impact in an area where there's still a lot of need. Yeah. Um, and so, about two and a half years ago, joined this program. Um, found myself in Kampala, um, you know, helping Andrew McCusker, the head of Edu Finance scale this program across now where we see eight countries um, across Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Yeah. Th thanks, Renee. What a story. Even it, I really am. It, it's, it's been quite exciting to, to partner with you, get to, to, to go know you and see your work. Now, you know, tell us about, okay, we, we talk about, you know, it's almost 15,400 schools, right? Uh, millions of children being, being educated uh, and have been educated. How did we get here? What is it that opportunity actually does to mm -hmm. get uh, education to these children? What happens? How do you know? How do these schools come about? How do they get the financing in place? How are they run? Who are these children? T tell us a bit about that. No, yeah, that's that's a great one. As you mentioned earlier, we still see nearly 300 million children that are still out of school, close to half a billion that aren't learning, that, that have access but are not learning. Um, mm -hmm. And while we've made significant progress um, in the last 10, 20 years, uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, yeah. And as you mentioned, you know, opportunity being financial services saw, you know, organically um, entrepreneurs, community leaders stepping up and opening schools to meet this demand. Um, and so that's kind of how Edu Finance, the program that I work for, developed about 10 years ago, yeah. is really partnering with that local effort. So entrepreneurs opening affordable private schools to meet the demand of those who are still unschooled or those who are not receiving a quality education. Um, government in, in low and middle income countries where we operate in have taken significant strides to reach everyone but has still not been able to to meet that demand so we're we're coming in to, to fill the gap um, you know while these systems are, are still developing and are still growing to to create access to everyone um, and so the the core part of our program which we started with was providing access to finance to this local effort to help expand it and catalyze what they're already doing so um, we work currently um, we started with one financial institution. Now we're working with 58 across 23 countries, um, you know, providing support to develop, um, you know, financial products that are geared to the education sector, um, helping support with um, market analysis and, and training to financial institutions so that they can better serve um, this affordable private school sector that is really in many countries where we operate serving upwards of 50% of, of, of school going children. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, I remember, Rene, this was in, in my travels. I was in Ghana uh, in a suburb of, uh, uh, of Accra called Tema, mm -hmm. right? At one of the major uh, universities of, uh, within the University of Ghana's base there. Well, he, uh, we, we went to this little school, and I'll, I'll mispronounce the name, but uh, Helena Akiti, you know, she had moved into that community about uh, uh, a decade back and saw kids walking on the street when they should be in school. And she said, why? Well, there aren't any enough local schools, enough seats available. So she took upon herself to, to start the school and actually approached uh, Opportunities Bank in, in Ghana for, for, for a loan opportunity, uh, 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 savings and loan so in, in Ghana. And we gave her a loan and she started what the Samalena International School. And now it's right from um, actually uh, kindergarten, starts in kindergarten, and, and her school now goes through junior high, and she's got mm -hmm. 200 children. And I think it's those stories that you see repeated, right, in, in 15,400 schools, 28 countries. Is, is, uh, uh, it's uh, Helena in one, one place, and it's uh, James in another place, and you know, it's, it's uh, uh, Lanero in another place who, who have taken upon themselves, local people. Uh, said, okay, we are going to set these schools up because we want our kids to be educated. Mm -hmm. Well, then you don't stop there, right? We saw that the schools were had been set up. Oh, 
well, how do you run the schools, right? Mm -hmm. What do you do with, with actually providing, improving uh, the, the management and, and the running of the school? What do you do about improving the quality of education of the children? So right. that's where then, in fact, the program that you lead started, education quality. So mm -hmm. tell us about that, because on the one hand, we are providing both, uh, you know, expertise, uh, as startup expertise and ongoing, uh, as well as startup capital to lenders to get into this. To, to lend into this market and increase mm -hmm. the number of schools. But on the other hand, you're working directly with the proprietors and the school uh, 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 managers and, uh, you know, and the teachers and the heads of schools to improve quality. So mm -hmm. tell us about this second leg, which I, I think is pretty unique, but you know, it, it's in terms of innovation, was a big jump for, for a, a financial services nonprofit, but you guys did it. Mm -hmm. uh, here you are, and, and from everything I've seen, very successful. So tell us about that program. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And a lot of you know the research and evidence we see behind microfinance is we know finance isn't enough just in itself. That you know mm -hmm. with training and support, um, relationship building and trust, um, people can go a lot further. Um, and so you know we entered the finance sector as that was very natural and organic for us, and then started to see and you know that it's not just enough to provide finance. That we also need to make sure that the schools um, are are actually providing a quality education. So Helena mm -hmm. from from Ghana that she gets the support she needs to to know how to run on um, a successful school business, know how to um, knows how to recruit the right type of teaching staff and to support them in their professional development, so that children, um, you know, are able to achieve the learning outcomes that that they need to move on in life and be successful. So the education quality program, as you mentioned, that that I work that I'm working on, we have about you know 40 people um, on our team across multiple countries and continents. Um, and we provide the non-financial services directly to the schools who are borrowing from our partner financial institutions. Um, and what we know, um, we, we work with two stakeholder groups specifically, and that's the school owner um, and the teachers. Um, and what we know about the school owners in our program is they come from a diversity of backgrounds. Um, you know, some of them have maybe owned other businesses um, and saw the need in education and, you know, transferring their business acumen to, to the school sector, but maybe they don't know much about education or mm -hmm. teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. um, then we have former teachers um, who want to open their own schools because they see a need in their community, but no, don't know much about running a business. Um, then we see Helena who sees a need, um, no background in business or education, and needs a little bit of support with both, right? And so when we focus on the school leader professional development, we, we, we're with a mixed bag here. So we provide support on you know, how to run a successful business. So looking at business planning, financial management and budgeting, teacher ret recruitment and retention, um, plus many others. Um, we also focus on the necessities of teaching and learning. So what does a school leader need to do to cr provide the, uh, create the conditions for learning in their school um, and so supporting their teachers to be successful. We also focus on professional development of teachers as well, so helping them really succeed. And, and what we see in this sector with teachers is often they don't really um, you know, have the opportunity to pursue education um, training. They don't you know, have the, the resources to get certified. So we come in and provide in-surface training um, to really upskill and professionalize this teacher workforce that is serving you know, half the population of school going children in many of the countries where we work. Um, and we, last but not least, one of the most important bits is we connect people to each other. Um, we very firmly believe that uh, people are stronger when they're working together. Um, we see a really a lack of connection between school owners when they were all facing the same challenges and can really learn from each other in terms of what they're doing well. So our skilled education specialists to go out into the field, bring schools together in what we call clusters um, so that they can support each other, collaborate, learn from each other, and you know, have a have a stronger collective voice um, you know, when they want to advocate for, for themselves at the policy level or or any other elements which which would help them really achieve their outcomes, uh, mm. objectives. Th th thank you so much. In fact, I remember when we visited in Kampala, it took me to the meeting of the Sunshine Cluster. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in a, I remember in 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 a, in a slum uh, in, in Kampala, and we walked in there, and you know, obviously, it, it was a, a building with a tin roof, and uh, I didn't tell you then, but it reminded me of my own school uh, when I was going to school in in India in a very remote part of the country. Same tin roof, and mm -hmm. here we are, right? I walk in there, and my mind's thinking about my own school experience, uh, uh, and uh, the head of school, uh, uh, they had, they were having the meeting. I remember. Uh, 
the uh, Rene in a, in what he called his uh, his computer lab. Well, uh, and his his library, both right in in that big uh, in that big in the room there, about seven eight of your school proprietors were there. You were there, and and your your our local staff member. His entire computer lab consisted of uh, four broken laptops. Mm -hmm. right? I think we have more working laptops in my home. Mm -hmm. And the library, I'm going to turn his li entire school library was the size of one of the shelves of, of my own bookshelf and he was so proud so proud and, and i you know it it, uh, it both encourages you and breaks your heart at the same time uh, renee yeah, seeing that is uh, how much can uh, you know the, these uh, children and, and these school providers do with so little and i, I remember asking me he said well five books are required uh, in uh, by by according to regulation uh, at the primary school level per mm -hmm. child and what the children can afford the school can is one per child, right? If at all, and we tell you, you look at where, uh, uh, how in fact fortunate we are and then where these kids are in the schools and how in the middle of that, with, with your guys' help, they, they are really putting it all back together. Very impressive. Your Pathways to Excellence program, very impressive. I mean, you've codified the knowledge of all that you've gained about education quality and mm -hmm. put it I don't know what they are, how many there are at that time. There were 30 different disciplines of practice. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah. And I I think it's important, um, you know, when we talk about the qualities mm -hmm. to define what we mean by quality, which is pathways to excellence, um, and really helping the schools define what that means for their institutions. So we have many indicators, as you mentioned. Um, we started at actually 42, and we've brought it down to 18 of the most important ones through our experience thus far. Um, but I think that's really key because we can throw around that word quality a lot, but what does it actually mean? And actually, with the with the onven of the the sustainable development goals, that was a big push, uh, moving mm -hmm. from access to quality and defining what we mean about quality, setting global standards and you know local standards at the micro levels, so that schools can actually implement and actually make it achievable. And you know, and you bring up a good point. I mean, yeah, as we are pursuing sustainable quality education for all under the SDGs, here we are, right? It is uh, you've got uh, fifteen thousand schools, and and now close to about six million children who have benefited, continuing to, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. as we sit here, speak, stand here today. Uh, currently, over two and a half million children enrolled mm -hmm. in those schools. It, uh, so it, it's been extraordinary. Well, and here you are, right? Busy going about your program. And out completely out of the blue, ten weeks back comes COVID nineteen. Yeah. <laughs> right, and, and we all are still, frankly, wrestling, struggling, in shock, reacting. All of us, every one of us. There's nobody who's not. So tell us a bit about what's happened. Mm -hmm. this yeah, this I mean, to the teachers to you. I remember there was one weekend back in, in March where basically it felt like the world turned upside down, especially for the education sector. We just saw country after country after country where we operated in shut down and closed their borders, um, which means closures of schools, closures of public gatherings, um, completely isolating, um, you know, families, communities, individuals. And, you know, I've, I've worked through crises before, um, you know, the Ebola epidemic in West Africa in, in, in 2014, where we saw massive school closures. But this, you know, the difference was, with this is it's affected everyone in every corner of the globe um, and the isolation as well, um, you know, which means that there's not much we can do um, when a majority of our program had been, you know, face to face. And so, you know, this has, I think like the silver lining um, for this has been uh, really seeing the commitment and the effort, you know, of my team really coming together, our content developers, um, you know, our staff, you know, um, working night and day to really react to the current situation and find ways to really support our schools. Um, but what keeps me up at night is the fact that we're going to lose about 10 years of progress. And, and that's the reality. And that not only in the education sector, but but across the field. Um, and, you know, everything's going to be affected and it's going to be incredibly complex for us to address the challenges given the spillover effects and everything else. Right. So, you know, we, we keep hearing about schools reopening um, are, are dependent on so many other sectors as well. You know, public transportation has to reopen for a lot of kids to get back to school. 
Um, and so there has to be immense of coordination. And so that's that's what keeps me up at night. Um, what keeps me going is just the dedicated team and staff, our schools as well, that are you know looking for solutions. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, our, our world did turn upside down on I, March 16th uh, for me specifically when we saw about you know 90% of the world's schools shut down. And it's quite it's been quite an extraordinary uh, journey the last uh, ten weeks. Uh, it, it doesn't seem like ten weeks. It, it seems much longer. And you know we, we have more <laughs> like ten years. It, you yeah. know, I really am. I took take stock of this, and I'm you know we're standing here talking here, and over the next last ten weeks across the the, the our entire network, you've got a loan moratoria so that uh, our our uh, school proprietors don't have to worry about repaying the loans. Right, we put that in place, uh, made sure that their lines of uh, credit are available, so what funding they need to keep the schools running. Uh, but then we didn't stop there from a financial services perspective. Our partners didn't. I mean, to 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 the team's credit, you guys then went forward and you've set up everything from Facebook light pages uh, for the teachers. You've developed a COVID nineteen toolkit uh, for the proprietors. So talk us to us about a little bit about that. You know, what's that been like uh, mm -hmm. of now engaging teachers and helping proprietors you know, virtually? Because, and you did all that very, very swiftly. I mean, uh, for the different parts of opportunity, I think you guys were, were, were uh, the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so tell us a bit about what you've done to help people now. And then let's talk about, you know, where do we go from here? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and we we normally on on a on a normal day, and who knows if we'll get back to that exactly that normalcy that we used to know. But uh, we deliver an incredibly holistic program um, across many different sectors, and it's it's mostly delivered um, in person. Um, and we knew that that was no longer going to be possible, so we we went back um, immediately, had a you know couple task force and rapid response meetings in terms of what are going to be the immediate needs of our partners, both our financial institution partners and our school partners. Um, and we boiled it down to some very specific areas and started rap rapidly developing bite-sized pieces of content that we could deliver on multiple channels immediately, both to financial institutions and to our school uh, school owners. Um, and so this is related to you know, business planning and financial management in a crisis, um, you know, staff uh, retention, so ensuring that you're able able to maintain those relationships so the teachers come back and also the customer base, which is parents and students. So how to continue in engagement and learning and ensure that the students come back to school. I think the most devastating piece of this, the most devastating outcomes of COVID would would be that children don't go back to school or, and schools don't reopen. Um, and that's like the main two things that we are trying to address with our COVID response. So our team came together and completely did a 180 shift um, in terms of how we engage and using our relationships and the trust that we had built over the last several years with all of our partners and the channels that we had developed as well. So using every form of technology that we could coming all the way from Facebook to SMS and one-on-one -on -one phone calls to support them, even if it means just sitting there and listening to what they're facing that day. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, that might be enough just to get them through, right? Um, but also thinking about you know, what is your cash runway look like? Let's let's keep your business open. What's what's your next three months, six months, 12 months look like? What can you do? And then with that information, what kind of conversation do you need to have with your staff and your teachers? And then what conversation do you need to have with parents, right? And right now everyone's facing challenges. Families have lost their jobs, right? Um, they're not going to be able to pay school fees immediately. And so that needs to be an open, transparent, understanding conversation with the schools and figuring out what the best way forward is because everyone's going to be struggling. So in the past, when someone doesn't pay, it might be a bit of a different conversation, but right now everybody is facing those same issues. And so it's, let's be open, let's be honest, let's negotiate, let's find a solution together. And so right now, I think the most important thing I think we've built over time are these really strong relationships um, that, you know, they, they trusted us to come in, they trusted the content we were providing and the support that we were doing really leveraging those relationships um, to come in, in, in their hour of need. And so, 
we've kind of taken this as a week by week in terms of really assessing what the situation looks like. And instead of planning out for 12 months, three years, we're planning out for maybe a week to four weeks at a time um, and continuing to be adaptive and shifting. Um, we're beginning to actually see schools actually setting dates for reopening. So we're actually next week about to shift into the second phase of our work and help schools plan for reopening, which is going to be much harder than closing schools. And so so that's what we're preparing for next. So where do you go then? The, as you said, you're preparing for next. So what happens? I mean, mm -hmm. the, the post-COVID world, it's not clear at all. Yeah. Uh, where uh, we are, how will it shape? Uh, and uh, we are we are 100% sure, more than 100%, whatever happens in the next four weeks, 14 weeks from now, it'll look different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So what do you, what, where, where do we go from here? Yeah, yeah. Especially in your, your space and sector, which is so vital. And if we don't, if we have educated kids, we have uh, safe, safer moms, we have uh, better households, we have, you know, more livelihoods and, and eventually a, a, a better workforce and, and, and uh, a, a, a local society that thrives. Mm -hmm. At the very bottom, the ingredient is these children. So what happens next? Yeah, I mean, there's there's not... There's not a lot we know what the future will look like exactly, but we can plan as much for the unexpected as possible. We know that it's going to be incredibly complex. There's going to be a, a continuation of restrictions in place for school reopening and that the, the new normal, uh, we don't really know what that looks like yet, but we can start planning for it because we do know some things. We do know from previous experiences that there will be continued emphasis on creating safe learning spaces, healthy learning spaces. We know what the protocols are um, to prevent the you know the spread of um, COVID nineteen. We know what kind of um, support that we can give to the schools to think about that, um, and we know um, that. Um, there's going to be a lot of psychosocial support that's need to be given. Um, there's going to be stigma in a lot of the countries where we operate in. We know how to address some of th these things. So we're starting to provide that support now. Um, the silver lining is that, you know, whenever you're in a crisis, you learn. Um, you especially learn about what you didn't do in advance to prepare for something like this, and you start to build back better. Um, so we know that we need to build more flexible and more adaptive programs. Um, we've heard from many school leaders that they didn't think that they felt they were prepared for this. They didn't know how to do financial planning in a crisis. So we're thinking about how we're actually going to reshape our program going forward um, to actually incorporate more crisis management, incorporate and formalize more elements that are going to support schools um, to really weather, weather the storm and continue to be able to achieve their objectives. Um, we're also um, you know, thinking about how we can actually probably take a bit more risk in terms of the use of technology and things that um, we maybe felt less confident about using before. Um, I think some of the, the biggest challenges, especially in a lot of the African countries where we work in, um, is just the limited uh, you know, um, connectivity, um, the lack of will um, to really use technology um, as a learning tool. And we're actually hearing some of our you know, school owners telling us now that they understand the benefit and you know, wish they had invested more in this um, before. So I think a lot of the channels and a lot of the ways of communicating that we've had to resort to now, we might be able to use in the future. And a lot of our school owners might be more open to that investing time and resources. So I think there's a lot of things which we um, can do from this experience um, to build back better on the other side and make sure our schools, you know, have set up PTAs. So when they have crisis, they can call on these formalized structures to come in and support, um, you know, board of governors for schools and, and all of these other formalized structures that are meant to support and meant to, um, you know, collaborate and help people weather, you know, crises, um, you know, and so, so a lot of these elements <laughs> we're, we're considering um, for the long term, but, you know, of course, there's still a lot of unknowns about, you know, what restrictions will be in place when schools reopen, um, you know, what some of those things will look like uh, will be very, very different in every single country. So, you know, again, we're planning for the next few weeks. Um, and then after that, we'll plan for the next few weeks um, and then hope that things begin to normalize after some time. Um, I think the one thing that, that gets me through this process personally is thinking that, you know, this is temporary and things will change and there will be a new way of working that we can plan better for. You, you're so right. I mean, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm standing here uh, listening to what you have to say. And what strikes me is uh, what, you know, the team's done is take uh, 
uh, the basic ingredient which we've known for eons doesn't change is is, is trusted relationships mm -hmm. uh, that you guys have built and uh, you know knowledge that has come from the street right i mean you're in there in on, on what i call the cold face uh, but at the same time you know in this tremendously pressure cooker environment uh, you took uh, processes that we evolved of uh, uh, of quality improvement over years and, and telescope them down into in, into weeks of innovation, right? I mean, and you could do that because of who you guys are. So the the uh, uh, wow, I mean, hats off. You've taken you. relationships, you've taken your your deep expertise, you've taken your own passion and commitment, and then you've brought in everybody from you know Silicon Valley to 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 Main Street banks uh, and, and uh, got them to focus on one single thing, which is how do you improve? How do you now get schools to survive, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I had some, I mean, that, that, wow, talk about, we're talking about innovation that, that, that helps uh, build SDGs and, you know, talk about innovating in, in, a, in, a, in the COVID-19 uh, pressure cooker, you know, welcome to the age of coronavirus. <laughs> so, COVID-19 COVID pressure cooker, I, I like that one. I haven't heard that one yet. We, we've heard a lot of terms, um, unprecedented, uncertainty, new normal, new, but I like COVID-19 pressure cooker because I think it really talks to, you know, what I've seen, especially with our team. And, um, you know, I think this opens us up to um, an immense opportunity is the silver lining here and how we really leverage that and and try to to create something that's better on the other side of this, I think is incredibly important. Yeah, and you're so right. Is is what are the best ideas you know, that come out of the, the new ideas? Because that's how uh, it's not just that's how people uh, how we move forward is mm -hmm. in the tremendous pressure cooker environments. The best ideas come, and then you, the, you get to sift them one way or the other very very rapidly, and, mm -hmm. and and off you go. And you know, in fact, even your Facebook like page for educators as well, that wouldn't have been something we normally did because we yeah. deliver uh, <laughs> our, our expertise in person. Yeah, and now you got educators from different countries partnering well we never thought about that you know mm -hmm. how cool is that of an idea so it, it's it's one of those you know you kind of look at that and say wow uh, we we came out of this but now we're stronger in all this though i think the common thread uh, uh renee for us has been and this goes back to our founding 50 years back uh with uh, a local partnership right and we started as a local partnership between a, a group of visiting uh, businessmen uh, uh, from uh, Fall Places, Chicago, Illinois, uh, in 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 at that time a remote town called Cali, Columbia, with a local church, mm -hmm. uh, you know, having a a, a a a guy sitting on the street selling spices, uh, get a loan, and uh, here we are, 17 million clients, 50 years, and billions of dollars, and now, you know, 6.8 million children in schools later. So the power of partnership has always powered us, uh, and has has uh, I believe, frankly, progressed humanity along. In, in almost every sphere of, of life. If you're gonna tackle these uh, SDGs, which we are very committed to, we wanna see a world where every child is, is able to go to school. Mm -hmm. We wanna see a world where nobody goes to bed hungry. Everybody's got enough to eat. Uh, people are earning, there's nobody living on less than $2 a day or $1.97 left on the planet. Well, mm -hmm. we know it's been set back, you know, because of COVID-19. We know that uh, we'll dial back, it breaks our hearts. But then we as well believe that it is innovation and the power of partnerships and people who will who will get us through this and over to the other side. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about some of those partnerships that you've seen that just come to mind, whether they are with a school proprietor, whether we are with, with your local team, with mm -hmm. a financial partner, you know, bring to life what that partnership feels like to you. Yeah, I mean, if you think about the 1,700 schools that we're currently working with across the globe, I think that, um, you know, has been the most interesting and rewarding partnership that I've seen on my day to day and schools stepping up and, you know, engaging in channels and supporting um, each other across different countries. So as you mentioned, we set up these Facebook Lite groups. So Facebook Lite is a, virgin, a version of Facebook that, that works on a 2G network, very low bandwidth, low connectivity areas. And when we work with schools in a small group of, you know, 12 schools of their peers, now they're working on country level 
groups where they're, you know, actually recording Facebook live sessions and sharing their experience with other proprietors, engaging in conversations with others that they hadn't actually connected with before. Um, and so we see those connections, those relationships that we've been seeding for so long really come into play um, and come into action um, when, when it was really greatly needed. And then we see a lot of these macro partnerships that, you know, connect myself and, and my colleagues on the senior management team to learn from what others are doing in the sector to, to get resources, both um, in knowledge, but also um, finance to help us continue with what we're doing. Many of our, you know, donor partners um, like the Elma Foundation and USAID have been incredibly helpful during this period. We know organizations like UNESCO, the World Bank, have set out global guidelines on school reopening, um, safe school spaces that we've been able to pull on um, and, and adapt and contextualize for our, you know, local partners, our schools, our financial institutions. Um, you know, we've been really been able to, to pull in a lot of these relationships and we don't see anyone shying away despite everyone, everything that everyone is facing both on a personal and professional level, people are making time. Um, and, and that's pretty impressive. Um, you know, I think you meet a lot of people that really care in the sector, so it's great. It, it truly is. I mean, it's quite a marvel, right? Like you've got uh, Helena and, and Jackson, we spoke about earlier, your school proprietors, and over 15,000 of them around the world, and, and in now in turn, uh, and uh, millions of parents. Well, a, a partnering with them, uh, you know, and here we are, right? The, almost like I think of ourselves, uh, you and I, as a bridge of that partnership. On the one hand, then our organizations like Cisco that's provide digital technologies, mm -hmm. Caterpillar that's provided funding, right? Uh, mm -hmm. You've got uh, Credit Suisse, I mean, for 10 years mm -hmm. uh, partnering with us, Elma, as you mentioned, Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. it, it, it just is, it, it's it's just a tremendous, uh, you know, and then you've got 58 local banks that we're partnering, mm -hmm. right? And, and people who never thought about education finance till we introduced them. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in 28 countries and at innumerable local uh, nonprofits, and, and uh, to me, that is what's going to carry us forward. Yeah, right. Uh, there is uh, a, a African proverb that I was introduced to many, many, many years back that says that, uh, and it's uh, uh, from uh, the Swahili, but the English translation. Uh, you know that if you want to go uh, uh, fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Absolutely. And that's been a journey uh, of going far, uh, Renee, and you've come far, and I am convinced uh, that we will go far. COVID-19 or nothing, this we, we, we will go far, and we will because that's what the human spirit is. Uh, and, and in that going far and going together, I want to just uh, close with inviting everybody who's listening today or will listen, is write to us, uh, uh, talk to us. Uh, we are looking for partners. We are looking for ideas. Mm -hmm. The only way we have progressed is, is by, uh, you know, listening to others, by building trusted relationships, and bringing the power of partnership into that, and then you know, putting into that that pressure cooker, if I could use that word, innovation and expertise. Very passionate, very committed people. Uh, uh, Renee, like yourselves, uh, Andrew, I, I, you know, the the, the, uh, the the list is long, and it's 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 a good list and a proud list. But when you put all that together, progress happens, and we tackle complex uh, humanitarian issues like the SDGs aim to tackle. Mm -hmm. uh, so we live, and I do believe still today, uh, even after COVID nineteen, we live in an age and a time that like no other. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we talk about COVID nineteen, but frankly, if you take a step back. This is the first time that all of humanity got together to tackle a crisis. It's never happened before, right? Mm -hmm. You and I are standing on on now uh, 30 years of committed progress on, on humanitarian development goals. Uh, the lowest number of people living in extreme poverty, the highest number of students in the world, mm -hmm. right? The lowest maternal deaths, uh, the highest number of girls being educated. I mean, the, the age of marriage declining, the number of uh, uh, economic uh, livelihood improving, all that has happened. Uh, and yes, today will pause us a bit, uh, uh, COVID will, but I don't think it will stop us. So mm -hmm. thank you and write to us. Those of you who are listening, please write to Renee. Her, her uh, uh, LinkedIn and Twitter is on there. Uh, you can write to me at uh, CEO at opportunity.org. 
you want to talk uh, and learn more about Opportunity, go to our website, uh, opportunity.org. Uh, and specifically, if you click on the education finance, uh, you know, uh, uh, sidebar, you, you will get to know a lot more about our education finance program, as well, our, our work with the farmers, smallholder farmers across Africa and now Latin America, uh, our ag finance program. And of course, our, our many, many years of work in microbanking. Uh, bringing uh, financial solutions uh, to, to families to help them build businesses, earn a living and get out of poverty. So thank you. I want to close by thanking George and the IDHN team uh, uh, for hosting us and giving us this opportunity and frankly holding uh, this innovation summit. So I will wish the team and everybody the very best. Uh, and uh, for the viewers, I, I trust uh, and hope this has been uh, an exciting and engaging time and that we will see you virtually on our screens. And when, uh, you know, the, the planes start to fly again, if you will, and we start to travel in the streets in Kampala and Nairobi and Accra and elsewhere. Uh, so uh, till then, bye for now. And uh, Rene, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I know you're waiting for, for uh, the uh, restrictions to be lifted to catch the first flight back. back in Uganda, yeah, very yeah. much so. <laughs> and I, I, I wish I'll be able to join you, but look forward to that too. Yeah. Bye for now. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Uh, Take thank care. You. Thank you.